Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. My name is Michael Neal, and I work for a company called CloudBees that some of you have probably heard of. And I'm going to be talking about uh, replacing some of our core technologies. We were a startup. I guess we still are, uh, but we're growing rapidly now. And uh, along the way, we've had to make a lot of continuous changes. So I'm going to talk about some uh, lucky early decisions. I like to think it was foresight and good architecture, but it was really just luck. I'm also going to talk about uh, Linux containers and transitions. And also this awesome uh, animated GIF or video. There's lots of them on YouTube of crazy people that climb out of the car while it's driving and replace the tire, uh, which I can relate to a lot uh, with doing things in production. So I'm going to talk about some lessons learned on continuous changing. And I'm going to wrap up with some uh, monitoring and alerting stuff. Uh, health checks, this is something uh, developers don't often think about, but it's kind of important for this stuff. So yes, about me, I'm a co-founder of CloudBees. We're best known as the Jenkins company. Uh, I'm a developer with a keen interest in operations. And I help build Devit Cloud, our hosted Jenkins service, and run out Cloud, our platform service. And as you may be able to detect from my accent, I am Australian. And uh, yeah, there's some, uh, some of the signs we like to put that welcome people to swim in our beaches. They're, it's a little bit unrealistic, actually. The tentacle one, they're actually invisible. You can't see those tentacles. So working with cloud platforms, these are not as friendly as traditional hosting. Uh, a lot of people sort of wonder when I say that what I mean. Well, you do get this awesome power uh, at your fingertips. You can try everything. You can try different hardware combinations. You can iterate rapidly. But the APIs that you use to do your cloud automation are not, don't have the same quality of service as your hosts. Uh, I had to learn that servers are cattle, not pets. Uh, that's a common saying. Uh, and dealing with file systems is a real pain. Uh, in cloud environments, which are very ephemeral, things can come and go. File systems are a real pain, but you still need to deal with them. Multi-tenancy uh, is also an important factor that we think about to keep costs low and uh, sort of scale things out. So these lucky decisions I meant before. So isolating the EC2 APIs we built uh, initially for Rackspace and then Amazon. So isolating our API calls with a fault-tolerant REST app uh, for all our provisioning. The API I found uh, would go very, very strange. Uh, for a while, Rackspace's API would be down for about three hours on my Monday. Uh, that was a normal thing for it to do. Uh, you can hit API limits. You've got to back off and retry. So every time I came across this strange thing in the cloud API, I'd build, a, build it into a, a pathological API simulator and run my tests against it. The second lucky decision, uh, or lucky, uh, lucky thing we did was to enable servers to re be replaced by just terminating them. This has since come to be known as the chaos monkey approach, where you just have this thing called a chaos monkey that runs around terminating servers. Uh, the reality was this wasn't some grand architectural design or decision. This was just I didn't know or want to learn how to use Chef properly. So I could just hack up a new a AMI in development and then just swap it out by terminating. So this was a hack, but it's become kind of a core value of the platform. So this taught me uh, to be always changing and always replacing naturally. So it's a daily occurrence. Netflix have some awesome open source stuff uh, on netflix.github.io. And they've sort of productized a lot of these concepts. So Hystrix is one for doing resilient APIs. And Simeon Army is the overarching project uh, for the Chaos Monkey. So I've mentioned Chaos Monkey about three times now. So uh, what does it actually mean? Uh, Chaos Monkey is, is uh, you just terminate servers. You might have something that terminates it automatically, uh, or randomly, rather. But in, in my case, what I, I sort of call it Chaos Monkeying by we, we need to do an OS change. That results in a new Amazon machine image. Uh, so we just terminate it, and naturally, the system replaces it. If you use EC2 uh, autoscale groups, you can have it do it for you as well. You've got a security catch, uh, patch to apply. Uh, you can patch live, or you can create a new virtual machine image. That's one of the benefits of the cloud. Just terminate it and let it, let it replace itself. Is the server a bit sick? Well, you can, you can look at it. You can scratch your head for a bit, or you can just terminate it. So we do actually use Chef behind the scenes for a lot of uh, minor changes. But you know, if, if we're not sure, uh, if a server's sick uh, and we want it to get better, well, we don't. We just terminate it. This year has been not a great year for security. So we've had some big headline-grabbing uh, 
floors, and I'm sure some of you will recognise these, heart bleed, uh, SSL problem, shell shock, uh, leaking stuff into shell, uh, Poodle, another SSL one, and a Zen guest floor, which caused a whole lot of grief with Amazon about a month or two ago. But it's been a great year for logos. So the Heartbleed is my favourite logo. Shell Shake, there's some debate over it. I couldn't find a Poodle logo, and no one cares enough about Zen uh, to come up with a logo. So every one of those floors uh, resulted in a, a major upgrade cycle, uh, often you know in the middle of the night, as soon as possible. So we have a decision. We can upgrade it in place, or as I mentioned before, the Chaos Monkey approach, you can just terminate it and let it, nature take its course. So we have a new, new image ready to take its place, so we just kill it. So we, with the Heartbleed one, that was rather serious and urgent. Uh, we had hundreds and hundreds of Nginx servers all doing all sorts of stuff, mostly customer facing. Uh, we could have actually patched them in place, but we decided, no, we've, we've, got, we've got the new the new images. It's very easy to create. We had that straight away. Uh, so we basically warmed up new servers in each case and then cut over the IP and the traffic would cut over in a fairly smooth fashion. In that case, we were using something called elastic IPs, which were very ha handy, and then later we could terminate the old. So this, we, we didn't mutate our servers, we just replaced them with new ones. This actually worked really, really well. No half measures, no half upgrades. So other benefits to, to terminating or the chaos monkey approach uh, when you're making changes all the time, well, if you use something like Amazon and you're running enough servers, you, you'll be getting uh, daily events or daily notices saying, we're going to reboot these 10 servers or we're going to terminate those four servers. Uh, we might even have new servers that we created a few days ago and they say, oh, by the way, this server's uh, scheduled for retirement, which is a euphemistic way of saying we're going to just kill it. Um, they might say you're going to reboot it at some inconvenient time, you've got to take some, some aggressive action to, to protect your customers uh, from downtime. Uh, so, you yeah, know, we just terminate. Uh, this also encourages immutable servers, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the concept of, so you don't... Once a server is set up and running, you don't change its state, uh, its configuration state, um, but you roll out a new one with a new configuration state. And there are security advantages, advantages for this immutability. You can have certain directories that just you know won't change. So when I talk about this sort of cloud, ephemeral, chaos monkey world, people ask, well, uh, how do you deal with the data? Like, you've got data you've got to manage and store. And, and some cloud experts will say, well, if you've got a dependency on the file system, then that's a legacy app. But really, legacy apps are kind of a reality for a lot of us. A lot of us actually like a file system, would like to use one. Uh, Amazon has an excellent API called EBS, excellent system, and that allows you to create uh, volumes very quickly based on snapshots. This is an incredibly powerful feature. You can actually take a snapshot of very large volumes and it'll only uh, take a delta of what's changed in the file system, and you can actually Reinstantiate those volumes in different data centers very, very quickly. Uh, it allows you to route around problematic data centers, or they call them zones, but they're really data centers. And this gives you a faster time to recovery. So, containers. Uh, we had a containment challenge for running untrusted code. So, we ran apps for users, we ran Jenkins masters, and we ran build executors, three areas that we need to deal with containment. So, apps. Uh, our pass, our platform as a service, well, they can do anything. Builds, builds are pathological. People do all sorts of crazy stuff in builds and they just want a clean slate at the end and at the start. Uh, and Jenkins masters have plugins. So Jenkins has this plugin architecture that can do all sorts of things. We also, for our own sake, we wanted to be able to do multi-tenancy to keep the costs low so we could have lower price plans, have higher density, and allows us to scale out with more fine-grained control. So we started uh, with Unix. Uh, user isolation and C groups. C groups control resource usage in, in Lurx. Uh, we then moved on to LXC, uh, which builds on C groups and namespaces, and we're transitioning to Docker, which builds on C groups and namespaces as well, not LXC, as most people think. Uh, Docker is sort of a natural evolutionary endpoint for containment. So, yeah, we've been doing Docker, uh, not Docker, we're doing Linux containers for quite some time. Uh, they do have some security benefits, but they're not complete. Uh, they're not a replacement for virtualization, but they can help. There's lots of changing content online. I'm not really going to go into it. Uh, the next uh, phase for Linux container security, I believe, is the user namespace stuff. 
So that's when you can run a container that thinks it's running as root. It can do all sorts of things that a root user would do, but it's not actually root. And that's coming soon to Docker. So in light of this, we had transitions in our build service, so the, the service that would actually you know, run Jenkins and run our, run our Elastic builds. So we started off with discrete little servers. We just picked the two smaller sizes of Amazon servers, and we just had different pools of them. And we'd start them, and we'd add them to the pool, and we'd, we'd even had a little mark and sweep garbage collection because there was a bug in my code that would leak entire virtual machines. Uh, and we used Unix and Unix user and C group namespace isolation, and we used volumes and snapshots. So we moved on from there to LXC, uh, which works great, and we also started to multi-tenant our builds so we could buy bigger machines, prepay for them, get better better value for money. We can pull our disks with ZFS. Uh, so as the I.O. in a virtualization environment can vary a bit, this allowed us to sort of work around it. Just gives us uh, more bursting power, better economics. And to get people onto a server that had their data already cached on it, we'd use consistent hashing. So this was a fairly big change. It happened about uh, happened last year. It took about a year. Um, this change from sort of discrete servers in pools to big pooled servers that worked in a radically different way using different technology. But we did it continually over a year um, without most people noticing, thankfully. Um, we had limited user opt-in and opt-out. Sometimes we'd give them a choice. Most people don't notice. So anytime we have a rollout, we sort of have these three strategies that we uh, apply. So we can roll it out to the 10% of users and then 50% and then we consider it's, it's safe. Uh, we also roll it out to tiered users. So we had uh, freemium users, so we'd often roll things out to them, use them sort of as, as guinea pigs in a way, uh, and, and users on you know, certain tiers of plans, would, we, we would change them more often. Um, and we could also just roll it out to everyone all at once, but it doesn't necessarily take uh, until people restart different services. So that's sort of a natural way to roll out. But the most important thing is that we always dog food. So we're always, we build on our, our own stuff on our own platforms, and we always roll things to ourselves first. And we sometimes discover bootstrapping problems if we have a circular dependency on our own stuff. But the most important thing of this is about dog fooding. So this is the phrase, eating your own dog food, uh, is that it's an indicator of confidence. If you're not happy to roll out your changes to yourself, then they're not ready for users. But it also gets you used to this continuous changing environment as a user, so you're experiencing your own stuff as a user. So we use Jenkins itself to build our Jenkins service and, and continuously deliver Jenkins itself. And it works something like this. So we set, have a change in upstream, that might be Jenkins itself or some, some library or something. That goes into a master branch of a chef recipe that gets built by a, one of our own Jenkins services to the test environment. And if we're happy with that, it goes to the production branch, and that gets rolled out via one of those three rollout strategies. And those tests and production environments, well, there's a chaos monkey running around terminating them at any time. That's the dog food uh, instance, just to show it's real. Um, also, being an open source project, it's great because you can get lots of wide feedback. So we want to do a, a, a Docker container for Jenkins. Uh, so myself and Nicola, who's sitting here, have have been working on this, and we actually get thousands of downloads, lots of people using it, and we discover all sorts of little corner cases that way. It's really good to cast a wide net for feedback. So for continual change of always evolving a service like this, uh, some lessons, I'd say. The biggest one is that the cost of change, and this should be obvious, is a, is a function of the gap, the time gap between deployments. Uh, and this is what continuous delivery is all about. I'm sure you'll hear about this elsewhere. For me, the biggest thing is keeping the mean time to recovery low. So a lot of people talk about high availability and not letting things go down. Uh, I think in reality, often, if, if you can recover really, really quickly, uh, people won't really notice. They'll blame their internet or something. And you can actually uh, you can be a lot more agile that way. So DR, disaster recovery, people, something people talk to me about. It's kind of, to me, it sounds almost uh, 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 an old-fashioned term, DR, in, in a cloud world. So they ask about DR strategy, and I sort of say, well, we're actually continuously exercising disaster recovery. We're always failing things over. We're always terminating things and moving it somewhere else. So it's really just business as usual for us. Uh, so basically, our, our service restoration or our disaster recovery is—it's really, 
it's actually just normal. It's not an exceptional thing. So we do run a software as a service, and if people sign up to a software as a service, there's some expectation from them that there'll be upgrades and changes. They're not always happy about them, but that's just life. Um, I like to communicate to users on changes, even if they don't necessarily notice them, and just let them know how much you know, work we're doing for them. That's what they're paying for, after all. Some are visible and some are not. Surprisingly, even outages or mistakes uh, on our part can actually create goodwill. Uh, you have some outage, it might have been an honest mistake, or, or, or it, there's, there's lots of reasons. But if you go to, if you go to a, a customer that values you and you explain what happened and why and what you're doing to mitigate it, they've actually become more attached to you as a company and as a, as a software service uh, just by the fact that you've been transparent with them, but also because they now realise, wow, that sounds like hard work, I wouldn't, do this, wouldn't want to do this myself. Monitoring and alerting. So this is not often talked about in classic developer circles. DevOps circles uh, tend to talk more about monitoring and alerting. There's a whole conference dedicated it, to it called Monitorama. And this is kind of a staple of traditional ops people and people who are on call. But the reality is uh, it's sort of smearing them out amongst other developers. So I, I don't know who amongst here sort of does production and operational stuff, but it's, it's, you know, it touches us all increasingly. So why should you care about monitoring as a developer? Well, in the face of continual change, you need to think a little bit more about monitoring than maybe throwing it over the wall and letting ops deal with it. So the question I like to ask, uh, are things better or worse than before a change, or are they better or worse than yesterday or last week? Not so much is everything perfect right now, because it won't be. There's always something broken or something's too slow. But are things better or worse? That's the important question. So monitoring alerting, this is sort of a, a, a quick intro for those who are not that familiar. There's sort of three general areas. So there's something called check engines, Nagios and Pingdom, and checking whether things are alive or not. Uh, these receive events and then forward on a message if, it's, if it thinks it's down. Then there's notification systems. PagerDuty is the most famous one, but email and SMS and so on. And then the, the final area, which probably gets the most investment and attention, is ana analytics. So sort of graphs, drawing graphs everywhere. People love doing graphs and dashboards. Uh, so yeah, here's a, that's the, the top one is actually Librato. Um, we instrument all our code, so any time you put a little bit of instrumentation code in there, it ends up in Librato metrics as a graph. Nargios is very much more of a binary, is it up or down type system. The bottom line is all these tools exist to inform you. So those graphic dashboards, like, like that, that sort of uh, Librato stuff can be quite overwhelming. You don't want to stare at that every day, or at least I don't. Some people do. So some people think once they've built their monitoring, they've built a you know, whole lot of set of graphs. They think it's great. That's an end goal. It's not really. It's, it's really often too much information. And if you're like me, you just want to know, are things OK or not? Can I go home or not? The aim is to get insight when the problems are happening. And the aim is to notify the right people. So if you have to put graphing in your monitoring system, uh, one of the most important features, and I think New Relic is actually pretty good at this, is to have this sort of big vertical bar that shows a deploy happened here and then there was a sudden change. And you know, presumably that's a good uh, tr change. But yeah, if you, if you have graphs and, and you're doing continuous deployment and continuous change, and you've got monitoring everywhere, if you don't have these bars saying, here's where the different releases happen, then, then they're not going to be that useful because you're not going to be looking at the same stuff. Alerting and information fatigue. So this is a real world problem that's sort of now coming to our virtual world. Uh, a friend of mine uh, blogged about a paper that talked about cardiac monitoring in hospitals, so very rather critical monitoring compared to what we do day to day. So the cardiac, the, uh, the heart monitors, out of the box uh, come with thresholds that go from sort of early warning, warning, critical, the person's dying. So the idea is that you get early notice and you can take action and prevent it happening. The reality was there were all these beeps going off all the time. The people were, it actually got worse. Uh, the more of these they rolled out, more people would die. And so they did some studies into why. Uh, and they found out that a lot of uh, nurses and, and so on were acknowledging the alerts in the earlier stage and then leaving it until it was too late. And they're also just tired of hearing these noises. They didn't, 
they're hearing the, these alerts all the time, they don't seem that critical. So they started ignoring them increasingly. So what they actually did was they adjusted the thresholds of these alerts to, to actually not do a warning, to actually only go off when the person was actually dying. Uh, so in that, in that sense, there's no point in acting that alert. If you, if you don't act now, they're going to die. Uh, this increased the urgency of alerts, but reduced the overall noise and volume, and it actually reduced fatalities, which is it's kind of the opposite to what you think. So I thought that's a fascinating study on alert and information overload. So in light of that, uh, it's good to avoid warnings uh, from systems uh, when you're doing monitoring, the warnings that just say, hey, cool story, there's this thing happening, is that happening? Uh, they just add to interruptions. Um, it, I prefer to leave it until things are actually critical. If you use uh, chat rooms as part of your uh, organization, there's this thing called chat ops, which is basically using APIs to these chat systems, and you have your, your build server talk in there, and your pager duty and whatever, and you can interact with these little bots that talk in your chat room. That's a great way to get information in front of people because if you're staring at a chat window, you're, you're not in the zone, you're not focusing, you're already distracted anyway, so that's a good time to, to add some information to that stream. Uh, we also do follow the Sun support, so if you have a team distributed around the world, it's just really fantastic. Uh, we sort of have handoff from the US to my end of the world, Asia Pacific, and then we hand off to Europe later in the day, and there's, there's always someone around. And I don't know why people don't do that more and have you know, at least some staff spread around the world. It's fantastic. So when you've got continuously changing systems, continuously deploying, uh, of course you have great tests. We all do great testing. Um, uh, well, I don't. I'm sure someone does. Um, when you have integration tests, unit tests. But it's still nice to have an end-to-end -end testing, testing or an end-to-end -end monitor. So we have all these great, great tests at uh, development time, but why save them for de development time? Why not run your tests continually in production? So why not take some of your integration tests and do it against production with real data? So it could be what's called a synthetic transaction. So someone signs up to your service and, and runs some process and go all the way to the end, and it's just and once it finishes, you start it again. And you run it continually, and any time that fails, well, that's a critical alert, because something has changed in the system somewhere and caused something important to break. But you can use, you know, use CI jobs to do that. We use Jenkins to do that. It's, it's, it's kind of a midway between monitoring and testing, but technically it's monitoring. This just increases confidence. So as confident as you can be with your unit tests and everything, uh, the reality is if it's not actually running properly in production, it doesn't matter how good all, all that other stuff. So, so, so some people in the monitoring community call this out-of-band end-to-end test or UberTet. So it's actually monitoring, not testing, but I think that's a great thing uh, that, that we've we picked up. So uh, a really cool Java library, and it's actually there's a Go version of it now too, is Codahal Metrics from the Drop Wizard project. So this is a great way to add sort of deep instrumentation to your app just as a library, and that can be the result in a binary health check, like a certain certain feature of your app is okay or warning or critical. And you can also do numerical stuff like gauges, uh, meters, rates of things, uh, collect data for histograms and so on. And this does all the boring statistical stuff for you. And the end result of this is you expose a, you know, every service you run exposes a health URL or publishes some data about itself, uh, which can then be pushed to metrics and monitoring. Uh, we, we tend to do it via a servlet, so any, any service, especially if you're doing microservices, you can go slash health and you get a, an overview of how things are going. So a gauge measurement uh, is really easy to incorporate. It's just you register it with a metrics thing, and any time it wants to sample a value, it just calls that little callback. Uh, a common thing to do, um, if you're like me and you debug code, is you put you know little timers and you measure the time delta, and then you do something with, well, this process took so many minutes, this took so many milliseconds. Well, you can do it with this, and this actually creates a histogram, so you can look at percentiles of times. So rather than doing an ad hoc thing, you can use this library. So the main points I hope someone can take away from this short talk today is, if you haven't already, give Drop Wizard and Code of Metrics a good look. I think it's a great example of building an application that's very supportive of continuous deployment and continuous change. I think it's a great, a great tool. 
Um, instrument your apps with health checks. Even if you're not going to use them straight away, you, you will eventually. Have a think about monitoring when you're building apps as well. How would you check the health of it? And then back to what I was saying earlier, uh, things like the, the Chaos Monkey and if you're, if you're working in a virtualized environment or a cloud environment, consider, consider replacing or upgrading servers by terminating them uh, you know, rather than mutating servers. So terminate and restart are often a completely OK way to recover. So that's it for my talk. It was only a short session today. So I think we've got a few minutes left for questions. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to, to hear. Otherwise, you can have an early mark for the next session. Yes, the, so AWS has cloud, CloudWatch metrics. Um, so yeah, we incorporate that as well. Um, but it tends to be, it's like a second tier of information because all of our apps have this code of how metrics built in. If the server underlying is going crazy, then it tends to reflect in that. But yeah, I will tend to, if, if a server is misbehaving, usually the last thing I look at is I go to the, the CloudWatch metrics and I see that the CPU's flatlining or it's uh, mostly what happens because network partitions or just you know some other fault happens mostly what happens is you see a graph in CloudWatch metrics and then it just stops and you think well that's bad uh, the data can't get out so yep shoot it in the head so yeah I do but I find it's much less useful in the, the deeper data from the from the apps so otherwise you have all these graphs of CPU and memory usage that really are in the abstract don't don't mean anything. I, I don't care if my CPU is at 100% as long as it's working. Anyone else? You have a few minutes, I think. All right, thanks very much, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions. <laughs>